and good morning we are live welcome to better smarter learning here today with abudi shabby hi hi abudi how are you doing all right thanks rachel how are you uh, i'm very good thanks we, we were just saying the video was vertically challenged because his laptop looked like made him look like he was a half the size of me so we sorted that one out um so to introduce the show today with better smarter learning i'd just like to say a quick thank you to our sponsors who is passion toolset which is a tool set in a book and a masterclass and it permanently shifts your mental blocks um, uh, for, of coaches, leaders and learning students and it helps coaches to um, supercharge their business for students to deal with overwhelm and procrastination in learning and training and leaders generally to deal with the complicated nature of life and it does that through behavioural daily nudges and it's a journal in a book. So thank you to our sponsor and now to the interesting bit for Better Smarter Learning. I am so genuinely, well I'm always genuine, and we'll get into that in conversations and language, won't we, Abudi? But I'm always um, very excited about guests, but this specific guest, um, Abudi, is um, an ontological lecturer, and we'll get a bit more into what ontology is, but ontology, I, I've studied a lot, and um, was where my heart started with coaching, and I love it as a specialism. So I am I am honoured to have Abudi here as a, um, uh, he is a lecturer at Henley Business School, and has been in the coaching industry of Rudy since the 1990s. Um, so maybe you could just say a quick word about yourself, um, if there's anything that I've missed off about, you know, coaching and some of your experience. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you're right. I've been in coaching since the mid 90s, and I've been involved in coach training, maybe since the early 2000s. And for many years, I was a senior trainer with an ontological coaching school. So, ontological coaching is definitely, you know, at the heart of the work that I do, and and probably the the methodology that I work with the most in my work. And last time we had a conversation, you were explaining a bit more about your motivations about why you 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 know look to get into that do you want to say a bit more about some of some of the motivations well, I, I, why, suppose, why you know, I mean I could say it in the sense not so much just about my own motivations but in terms of you know an attempt to explore what ontological coaching is anyway and you know I think ontological coaching one of the things that I find problematic about ontological coaching is having to explain it you know if I say I'm a coach it's not so difficult for people to get it if I say I'm a transformational coach it's not so difficult for people to get it but if I say I'm an ontological coach you know it always raises the question what is ontological coaching and I think that's not an easy question to answer but what I would say I suppose as a very kind of short opener is that ontological coaching takes a look at the the very essence of who we are and what we do in the world and so it requires a certain amount of curiosity about why we do the things that we do that we just kind of do or why we are the person that we are when we just go well that's just the way i am and that's it and you know my own personal background is that i was you know, my parents were from Iraq and I was brought up in Surrey and, you know, I was brought up in Surrey in the 1960s. So it was a very white, very formal kind. And I went to public school. So it was a very sort of formal environment. And yet my parents came from this very different culture. So even as a very young child, and certainly by the time I went away to boarding school, I was always asking questions about why do we do the things that we do? And, you know, my parents would be driven nuts by me saying, well, why do we do it this way? Because outside, you know, people do it in a different kind of way. And when I was outside, you know, with my you know English schools, I'd be going, well, this is a bit odd because we don't do this life at home. So I was always having that curiosity about the way things are and then I studied philosophy at university so you know I suppose my kind of training both academically and experientially has been to be somebody who takes a look at the status quo and asks questions about why so when I found ontological coaching in around 2000 yeah, it, it, it felt like a real fit almost immediately both academically and intellectually but also in terms of you know my own experiences of being a human being asking those sorts of questions yeah and i think we both established last time we both got this curious nature and there is that um element of curiosity in being an mm. ontological coach and you know like you you know you, you say in some of your papers being able to observe and, and for me what i loved once i 
you know, learn a bit more about ontology and was practicing it was that ability in a moment, in a conversation or something that might be going wrong in a situation to look at your, I mean, I love looking at myself and I, I'm this kind of raw character that I love breaking myself down and not everybody's into that, but I like pointing the finger towards me um, and just going, okay, how am I being, how am I being <laughs> about this right now? And for me, when people say explain ontology, you know, it's always just about the being and, okay, so at the moment I'm being frustrated or I'm being angry. Okay, so why am I being that? What's going on? And I just, I love that ability to unravel that. Mm. Uh, and I think that for me is the essence of, of partly of, of ontology, but um, it's obviously a lot more in depth than that. So, First question, Arudi, is can you say a bit more? Because one of your papers that you that you've written is about being blind to our blindness. So, for people who maybe don't know ontology so much, can you just touch a bit more on being blind to our blindness? Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of connects with what I was saying earlier. You know, we just in life. I mean, I uh, I would say this. Uh, you know, I'm going to go to and fro a little bit on this, but you know, I'm if you like, an ontological specialist. I've been working in ontological work for 15 years plus, maybe 20 years now. And yet I'm still, even though I know the theories and the, the application of it very well and can train others in it, it doesn't stop me from being blind to my own blindness. And I think there's something in that about we are the way that we are. And most of the time we don't question it. Or if we question it, I mean, you say that you question yourself about how you're being, and we might do that. But even when we're doing that, we're blind in our questioning because it takes something outside ourselves to see that which is kind of obvious to us and automatic to us you know so if I have a narrative that the world is dangerous you know let's imagine I grew up with parents who say the world is dangerous and there's a lot of fear in the home etc I don't even know that I'm thinking the world is dangerous or I don't even know that I've learned to see the world as dangerous I just hold well the world is dangerous or you can't trust people you have to be careful in life and those scripts live in me they live in my language in the stories I tell about the world but they also live in my body and my emotions so I might be fearful about life I might you know walk into a room being a little bit tentative like what's going on is it safe here and all of that stuff is happening without me even paying attention to it yeah because to be honest, most people think that that's the way the world is because that's their perspective. But they think everyone else is like that and that the world is actually like that. But like you say, it's what we've learned and grown up with. Yeah. And I want to take it a little bit further, Rachel. It's not most people. It's all of us. You know, I might yeah. know about ontological coaching and I might have written about it and trained in it. But when I'm in my own blindness, yeah. I, I don't notice that. I just thought, well, that's just the way that I am. I was having a conversation in a group I belong to just the other day, and the, the facilitator was saying, can you see what you're doing? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm really blind to that. So I want to. I, I don't want to have it be that because we've started ontological coaching, we're in some way any wiser in our own lives. Yeah. I still need someone outside myself. And, and the reason I say that is that, this concept of blind to our blindness isn't just something that when we wake up to blindness, to blindness, we go, that's it, I'll never be blind again. It's yeah. an ongoing process. Yeah, because we're picking up new perspectives and new frameworks as we go, and those could be limiting us or providing more potential and opportunity, but who knows? Each day you just pick up another um, assumption, judgment. That's you know? true, but also... Each time we get to take a look at ourselves from another person's eyes, we might see something that's been there for many years that we haven't previously had to look at. I mean, I think part of the reason that we, are, we stay blind to our blindness is that to some extent we could say that our blindness works for us. You know, I've learned to be yeah. this kind of person and it's effective. And it's only when I run into a situation which in, our, in, a, in ontological coaching we might call a break in transparency. In other words, that which was invisible to me suddenly becomes visible. It's only when that happens that I might go, aha, now I can take a look at something that previously... I didn't need to take a look at or wasn't made obvious to me. You know, it's a little bit like when we're driving a car. Most of the time, the car is transparent to us. We just get in the car and we drive. And if I'm driving to a meeting with you, for instance, I don't even think about the car. I might think about you and the conversation we're going to have or the, you know, experience we're going to have together. And then suddenly there's a clunking noise in the car or the car grinds to a halt. And in that moment, 
that which was invisible to me suddenly becomes very clear to me. And I think that's the ongoing learning or the ongoing experience about ontological blindness, if you like. As life comes yeah, along. And you, and, and you made me think when you said about the blindness bit that that can also be our friend because really from a from a person who hasn't studied this and if they look at it they'll go well actually that's going to cause me a lot of instability in my life if i'm constantly going okay you're blind to that look at it again look at it again and even when you've got a wider perspective look at it again is that are some people going to think well do i want my life to be that unstable i like my comfort of some of the perspectives oh, and again things that I, I've got. You know, Rachel, I, I I know I keep saying this, but I don't want it to be that some people, I mean, when I'm caught yeah, by my own sorry. blindness, I still want to stay blind because yeah. it, it creates instability or it creates, you used the word earlier, it creates an unraveling. I've been going yeah. through my life living like this, doing what I do, and then suddenly it becomes clear to me or a coach points out, or someone outside me points out that I've been blind to something. My first reaction is to defend the self that I've always been. It's not to go, oh, how interesting. I can unpick another part of myself. I think, in a sense, I might put it like this. We're almost addicted to being the person that we are. But I would disagree because I like the instability of looking at myself and breaking myself down and going, oh, yeah, that's just another perspective. And, and oh, there's my blindness again. I, I, that doesn't you know make me feel challenged or threatened i think there would be some people out there that would feel challenged and threatened by that i would agree and i suppose my kind of counter challenge to you would be what kind of being are you that likes that instability and maybe for you the challenge might be having stability and right. not you see i mean in right. a sense any observer any way of being becomes something you go well i like this Yes. And, you know, you're not the first person to say, well, I like change or I like looking at myself. And sometimes the challenge for people, and I, I don't know you, so I don't know what your, your narrative is, but sometimes people's yeah. narrative is, I like looking at myself and I like reinventing myself. And the ontological challenge for them would be to actually just stay the same. And, not and, and brilliant, because since in 2013, when I started looking at ontology, the practices that I have practiced in my life have been stability. Yeah. So that's really good. That's that's really good. I like that. Okay. So moving on to the second question, and just a bit more, you know, putting some but um, mm. flesh to the bones is, tell us more about the ontological learning. And you talk in your papers about language, emotions, and bodies. Can you? Can, uh, so, sorry. Yeah, yeah. The language, the emotion, and the body, and, and kind of people's narrative. And, and we touched upon this idea of people saying they're kind when actually they're you know there's. A, it's a bit more deep than that. You're not actually being kind in that situation or, or authentic. Can you can you touch on some of those aspects? Yeah, I mean, let's, 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 let's separate those out a little bit because, you know, the, the piece around language, emotions and body, I think is, you know, it ties in with what I was saying earlier. You know, if I believe that the world is dangerous, I've grown up believing that the world is dangerous. There's a linguistic mm -hmm. part of that. So I have a narrative that says the world is dangerous or you have to be careful. And if you speak with me, you'll hear me saying those sorts of things. Mm. But I might also have a body. Well, I do have a body, but I mean, my body might also be the kind of body that sees the world as dangerous. So that might be more tentative when I approach a group of strangers, for instance, or I walk into a room, or even if I walk out of a building, you know, I might be kind of punched up going, what's going on? You know, there's a sort of alertness that goes with an observer that sees the world as dangerous. And I might have emotions that are consistent with that fearfulness, for instance or, uh, you know, apprehension. Somebody who believes that the world is an adventure will have different narratives. You make your own luck, you yeah. can do whatever you like, you can trust people, you can take risks, but they'll also have a body that moves through space much more confidently. They might just walk into something without even thinking about it. And they might have yeah. a different kind of emotion, which might be an emotion of ambition or adventure or enthusiasm. So all three of those domains, language, body and emotions, are part of what constitutes the observer that we are. And it's yeah. easy for us to think about learning narratives intellectually. You know, we learn stories about the world, but we also learn emotions and we learn about moving through space. So we absorb all in all three domains. We're immersed in narratives linguistically, emotionally, and somatically, that shape us into becoming the being that we are today. Yeah. And so talk a bit more about some of those narratives. So what you, you, you'll have someone who's saying, oh, I'm being authentic right now. But actually, you know, there's not authenticity necessarily there. What, what, can you expand on that? I don't know whether you can remember when we spoke about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I do remember. I mean, I suppose I'm a little bit confused about the question that you're asking here in this moment about that, because mm -hmm. it, it's not so much that people are being inauthentic. Mm -hmm. It's more that what we're trying to do, and when I work with people, I suppose what I'm trying to do is they will say certain things. They'll have a linguistic narrative, but I'm also, and this goes back to you know bringing in emotions in the body. I'm curious about the being in front of me. So someone might say something, but I notice that their body tells a different story. Yeah. And then I get curious. You know, one of the examples that comes to mind is I was working with a client talking about his new role, being promoted to being a leader in his team, and he was talking about you know the need to, you know ask for people to do things or issue instructions and every time he said that he was giggling and he didn't notice that he was giggling and we oh. I spoke about that I said look I noticed that we're talking about these serious things you're laughing he said I didn't notice that and then I said does that happen when you're making requests of your team and he said yes and we explored it a little bit and he said you know the reason I do that is I want people to like me I was previously a peer of these people and now I'm their line manager and I'm finding it hard to take my new role and my responsibility seriously because I want to be liked and be the fun guy I used to be seen as. So in a sense, it's not about authenticity. It's about starting to see, does the narrative match? Does the linguistic narrative match the emotional narrative, the somatic narrative? And when we're working in coaching, ontological coaching, I get very curious about the human being in front of me and how do the things stack up, if you like. Yeah, and I think that's what I was saying. You said confused about the question, so I apologise if I didn't make it clear, but that was kind of what I was saying about being kind, is that you, you said if it's it, sometimes with people, the narrative of kind doesn't stack up with what's going on behind there because they might be expecting something back, whereas, you know, a lot of kindness is, you know, it's one way. I, I'm being kind. I don't necessarily expect something back, but a lot of time in, you know, society out there, you see people getting resentful, if they're being kind and, and, and things aren't coming back. Yeah. So. And, I, and I suppose in a sense, I mean, part of the reason that kindness came up in our pre-conversation mm -hmm. was that we were speaking about, you know, for instance, if I am overwhelmed, in an ordinary way of coaching that person, we might help them to work smarter or we might help them to prioritize. In an ontological coaching conversation, we'll start to get curious about how come they're overwhelmed. And one of the ways that we're overwhelmed is an inability to say no or an inability to ask for help. And then when we spoke last time, we spoke about it and we said, you know, if I have an inability to, to say no, part of that might come from a narrative that says I have to be kind. Yeah. So I'll always say yes, because if I say no, that would be an unkind thing to say. Now you're right to make the connection that if I'm kind, or if I'm being what I think of as being kind, and I'm not being true to myself, then it probably will sow resentment. Yeah. But it's not about, I suppose, it's not just about that kindness isn't authentic. It's that it, it becomes a script by which we live and we can't see a possibility to say no. Because if I say to a client who's overwhelmed, could you say no? She or he might say, actually, I can't say no because that would be an unkind thing to do. And then we get into, you know, what do they learn? Growing up, and they might have learned you always need to be kind, help everybody else. You know, it's selfish to ask for what you want. It's selfish to say no. So, it, 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 and then it, it it shapes the being that emerges so that when we're sitting in front of each other today, that individual finds it really hard to say no and then reports being overwhelmed and maybe resentful. Yeah. I mean, this is a really awful question to ask you, but how, how can you take a, a stab in the dark guess how many people actually have these conversations? Because I think there are people who naturally are self-aware um, I was very unself-aware up until my, you know, mid-thirties in my, in my, when I was 30. Um, Percentage-wise, really, I don't think many of us, even like you say, when we're trained like this, we forget all the time. Yeah, I mean, I suppose... Well, I would say 100% of us is unself-aware most of the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean... Yeah. Like, you know, I suppose it partly goes back to what you said earlier. You know, we don't want to spend our time going, why am I doing this? What's going on here? We just do what we do. You know, and sometimes people have said to me, you know, students will say to me, oh, you must be amazing in your personal life with all this. Like, no, I'm just not for jerk as everybody else. I'm no different. Yeah. You know, and I suppose in a sense it partly goes to, you know, knowing something is not enough. It's not enough to have intellectual information. 
or we know about yeah. stuff, or we meditate, or we do yoga, or we do all these things. You know, in our moments of being human, we're just a human being who is as ignorant and as stupid and as makes the same mistakes as everybody else. And I think that's a really important piece to, first of all, because it brings us humility, but secondly, because it brings us compassion for, yeah. you know, Blindness is, I mean, I suppose in the world in which we live, first of all, we, we prioritize language. So I think if we have information about something, that's in itself sufficient to get through stuff. And, you know, people will say, you know, if I want to become a leader, I read books about leadership, for instance. But people right. don't follow a leader because she's read a book. Yeah. You know, so we, we, we prioritize the linguistic domain of learning. Yeah. So we also think that learning is about gathering information yeah. rather than about experience. Yeah. And we forget that we are not just linguistic beings, we're emotional and somatic beings. So we might know how to be a good leader, or I might know that I should always be polite to people. But when someone cuts me up in traffic, I'm not thinking about it necessarily. I'm caught automatically. And I think life is a process. And maybe this is where the self-awareness bit that you mentioned comes in. For someone who does practice self-awareness, maybe through yoga or because of the work that I do, the best that I can hope for is to catch myself more quickly being a jerk yes. than I used to before. It's yes. not that I'm going to stop being a jerk. Exactly. Oh, exactly. And that's something definitely I advocate. And I think we should all be jerks because then we can just be normal and natural on ourselves and not make anybody feel uncomfortable. That, Like you said, you're some amazing coach or something. We're all jerks. Um, and I love that. Um, the, and this brings us on to, to the last bit that I wanted to touch on. And we've got yeah, sure. sort of four or five minutes of the podcast left, which is now what we're saying actually just I don't know whether we need to say any more about this is how do we increase that range or get people to change because that's really what we're saying is yeah. we have a frequency of absolute jerk and um, you know transformed human being and like you say on a daily basis we kind of go up and down this frequency depending yeah. on yeah. how aware yeah. we are what we're practicing etc yeah. so how can you give any tips and hints of, of how you would get people to practice this range? Well, or I, mean, their range? I mean, I think the thing is, is about it's all about the practice. Yeah. So, excuse me, we have a coaching conversation and the client will, you know, hopefully get some insight or some awareness about her or his blindness. Great. But if we don't do anything else, it just becomes another insight. And as one of my former teachers used to say, you know, insight is the booby prize. Yes. You know, and yes. coaching loves to talk about our oh, aha moments. But aha moments by themselves are just aha moments. But if we can start to notice, for instance, I've spent my life being this kind of person who has these kinds of practices, and this is my comfort zone. And then in my coaching, we realize that this doesn't always serve me. Being nice, for instance, doesn't always serve me. Sometimes I do need to be tough or say no or ask for what I need. Then I've got an awareness. And then we can take a look together with the coach to design practices that help me build the kind of person that can say no or ask for what she or he needs. Yeah. And then so what, practice. Yeah. So, what might an example of some of those practices? So, an example, for instance, someone who finds it hard to ask for what they want, an example of a practice might be boxing. Because boxing, if you if you ever study boxing, for instance, you know, part of boxing is having a good ground. You have boxing stand position. So you need to be clear on the ground. But also part of boxing is about delivering clean punches. And delivering a clean punch is a bodily way of delivering a clear communication. That's really interesting because I have this book there about people who've got weak handshakes. Yeah. And I'm like, be fair, I'm, it's nice to meet you. I'm really excited about meeting. And well, I think, I don't know, I haven't done a study, but I just think, what is behind that weak handshake? Yeah, so a weak handshake might be somebody who finds it hard to express themselves or own who they are. They might have learned to be apologetic for themselves in some way. And if we were coaching that person, as you say, we might say, be firm. Now, for you, it produces a bugbear reaction. As a coach, that reaction in you might also be a moment where you can say, you know, I 
without the judgment, but you might say to the client, I notice that your handshake is weak. And I wonder what that generates in others when you're talking about taking authority in your new role. So we always want to tie it back to the client's concerns. But you're absolutely right that the body of a weak handshake generates something in people, like maybe a reaction of be firm, or I don't trust you, or I don't feel confident with you. You know, I, I'm a big yoga student and I go to a lot of different teachers because I'm trained to be a teacher myself. And one of the things that I don't enjoy is a teacher who doesn't take charge of her room or his room. And that for me would be, you know, connected with the weak handshake. How does that person build? So they might know a lot about yoga, but when they're in front of a room, how do they build authority? And that might take a different kind of practice. So, you know, for me, it's all about how do we practice what we have learned? And the example I always use when I talk about ontological learning is learning to speak a language. You know, my first language is English and I'm absolutely fluent in English. But if I want to suddenly start speaking Arabic or French and I start from nowhere, then I'm going to have to practice and practice and practice. And when my parents came to England after 35, 40 years of living in Iraq, you know, their English was pretty rubbish. And even after 30 years of speaking English, it wasn't the same and it wasn't ever as good as my English. But the more that they practiced, the more comfortable they got in it. And I think yeah. if we're talking about building new range and new capacity as a client, as a human being, it's all about practice whilst recognizing that we will probably never be fluent. So someone with a weak handshake, for instance, who spent their lives being apologetic because that's what they've learned, is probably never going to be as firm as someone who's grown up believing absolutely in their confidence and authority. The flip side of that, of course, is that, you know, sometimes a firm handshake person might be too confident. So I, I, I suppose the reason I use that slightly flip analogy there is that I want to move away from the idea that a way of being is good or bad. You know, sometimes it's really good to be strong and confident and clear. And sometimes it's really good to be vulnerable and weak and lost. Agreed. Because in those moments of the weak handshake thing, you know, as a coach and, and as a ontological student, I would then go flip side. You know, what compassion can you show here? And what's that What's that person experiencing with the weak handshake? What's but, it also, there? but also, what does it bring? Mm, yes. What do they contribute? You know, because they're a softer person, they're gentler, more sensitive. Yeah, exactly. They'd be better than me in a lot of circumstances. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that awareness that the way of being that we have isn't bad or wrong. It's just that it doesn't, allow, it's not useful in every situation. And, okay. you know, I think it's really good for us as human beings. And this is another practice, I suppose, that. I work with in myself as a coach because I think it's good to have range as a coach is the capacity to be nimble and move more easily between different ways of being. So the strong person, can they practice being vulnerable? The vulnerable person, can they practice standing, holding their ground so that they can draw on either when they need it? And again, a bit like language, you know, if I'm in a bar in France, it's quite useful to draw on French. But when I'm speaking with my English friends, it's much more useful to speak English. I mean, it doesn't always work as an analogy, but you get the idea that we want to practice in order to be more effective in contexts other than our familiar places. Yeah, I love it. I love practice. Um, I, I was just thinking when you were saying um, yesterday's insight is tomorrow's ego. I don't know where I heard that, but I was just thinking when you said insight, oh, I've got an insight. I think that's just... Well, in a sense, ego. you know, I mean, I suppose the sense I'd make of that, Rachel, is that if I start to believe the insight as the truth, then it stops me from learning. And I think one of the difficulties we have with learning is we go, oh, I've learned this in my coaching or my therapy or my practice or whatever, and then this is the new way to be rather than what's going to serve best in this situation. That's certainly true for a coach. You know, once we learn a particular way of being as a coach, we might go, oh, that's it. I'm going to be this kind of coach. But actually, how do we stay fresh? Yeah. And that requires the capacity. And I think, you know, if we come back to this thing around self-awareness, the ongoing practice, you know, people sometimes say, as a coach, I can coach myself. And I always say, that's bollocks. <laughs> I can't because I'm blind to myself. I'm very beep, smart. Podcast, beep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry. I, I wondered about that before it came out of my mouth. And I, I <laughs> but, but yeah, coaching yourself. But, exactly. You need someone outside of yourself. We which need is someone outside, outside ourselves. And, you know, when I work with leaders, one of the things I say to leaders, for instance, is go to a place where you're nobody. Yeah. If you're surrounded by people who see you as a leader, you're always going to be in that sort of world where people tell you what you want to hear or you're the authority. 
Go and be in a place where you're just another person trying to learn something about being human because that gives you a bit more scope. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We are now coming up to the 30 minute mark. And honestly, it's been fabulous for me. Uh, you you, you, you turned my questions and you, you, you just provide so much uh, interest for, for me as a coach and this coaching channel. And I hope people have appreciated this podcast as much as I have. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you for the opportunity and the conversation, Rachel. You're very welcome. This is available on Crowdcast slash Passion Toolset. I'll send you the link and I'll definitely be sharing with my social uh, media um, so all the things we said. What, what, what did we say? We're all idiots. So you said a word. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Jerks, that's it. I'm yeah. going to use that as my headline on LinkedIn. We're all jerks. Well, you know, I, mean, I suppose in a sense, I mean, I, I will just end on this because I, I, I think, I mean, it, it was Tony Robbins who talked about awakening the giant within and being your inner giant and, you know, all that stuff's fine, but never lose sight with your inner jerk because the inner yeah. jerk is the bit of us that's human and the bit of us that is still willing to learn. And when I become the giant, then suddenly I'm the master of everything and that's no way to live. Sure, and it's the humility of leadership. Yeah. It really yeah. is. So you know, thank you. Thank you. And when, when Steve Jobs did his wonderful Stanford University speech, which I, I definitely recommend to everyone who's listening to this, you know, at the end he ended with a quote from the Whole Earth Catalogue, and it said, "Stay hungry, stay foolish." And that's a more kind way, maybe, of saying be in touch with the inner jerk. You know, let's stay hungry, let's stay foolish, let's stay curious about who we are as human beings. And I, I think if we do that, it keeps us fresh. Yeah, which is wonderful and gives us that range what we're talking about. So yeah. thank you again. And you. Um, I, I will speak to you soon, Abruzzi. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.